Hi gardeners, it's time for Mid-American Gardener and we're glad that you have joined us because we here on the set always wanna talk about plants and some people about bugs and we're ready to talk about anything that you have going on in your garden. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois on a summer hiatus right here at the moment, but I'm in the crop sciences department. So my area is cut flowers and perennials. However, there are three really great experts here on the set and let's find out who they are. And you're gonna hear them answer some emails or give some show and tells as well. All right, let's start first with you, Bill Vanderwhite. Okay, uh, my name is Bill Vanderwhite. I'm a certified arborist and my specialty is trees. And I have a question from a viewer about uh, a 50-year-old blue spruce said that uh, last autumn two branches of the spruce were turning yellow and he cut them off and he was wondering what could have caused this and is there any way from preventing it in the future. I will say that spruce is really uh, somewhat blue spruce especially fraught with problems uh, especially in the Midwest where we have maybe a little bit of heavier clay soils and warmer temps. It originates in you know, it, it's native to the Rockies, so sometimes it, it struggles a little bit here, but there are a couple of uh, needle problems, fungal problems. One is Cytospora, another one is Rhizospera, very common. Uh, Cytospora will affect the new needles and uh, Rhizospera will affect the older needles, typically. There is also another, quote, newer uh, malady of spruce called sudden needle drop. It was discovered in Illinois uh, described in another state, discovered in Illinois maybe about four or five years ago. And that's again a fungal problem. Now most of those problems are really quite difficult to control. Sometimes you can control rhizospera on some younger nursery trees. So uh, uh, it's, it's difficult <coughs> to say. The other thing, it could be abiotic. It could be nothing to do with a fungal problem. It could be uh, the site. Is it poorly drained? I is it um, too dry? From the description of the soils, which are near Lake Michigan, it so probably sounds like they're pretty decent soils because they like well-drained soils. Uh, my suggestion is would be to take uh, a branch with exhibiting some of those symptoms to your uh, extension agent or send it into a diagnostic lab, uh, you know, have somebody look at it. But um, a lot of problems with blue spruce. They have a difficult uh, time in our neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we find it, we'll put the plant clinic screen up because uh, yeah, there is yeah. one here at the University of Illinois. It's not really good news, is it? Uh, no, I'm afraid it's it's uh, the problems on spruce are difficult, if not impossible, to control. Right. Usually, once you see the symptoms, it's too late. Right. Right. There you see the plant clinic information, so uh, it can be done through your extension offices around the states. But if you want to just go directly, you can take care of it this way. Okay, thank you, Bill. And in the middle, let's go to John Bodensteiner. Uh, I'm, my name is John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. And I guess I like tomatoes. I do a lot of perennials, trees, shrubs, and especially hostas. I've gotten it, being I like trees and shrubs, I've had to go to hostas mm -hmm. because I have a lot of shade. But today I brought a tomato to talk about. Uh, this is a sun sugar. It doesn't matter which, which variety. Um, but I, I've had a lot of questions on determinate or indeterminate. This is a, an indeterminate. It'll keep growing until the frost kills it. The determinate has a much shorter production uh, life, uh, which is nice if you're going to do, it's mu much more concentrated. Uh, that's one of the values of, of determinate uh, tomatoes is that you get a lot more fruit in a short period of time so that if you <coughs> um, want to can or or process all of them at once then the determinate type is probably better for you. The indeterminate will keep growing and growing until the frost kills it. This one here can get up to 18 feet long in one year and it's gonna, this is a cherry tomato but it's a little yellow cherry but super super sweet but it can grow up to 18 feet and it'll keep producing flowers. You can see it's flowering already. It produces flowers right away and it'll keep producing flowers and fruit until it freezes. So 
18 feet. 18 feet. Wow. That's a lot I, of tomatoes. Yeah. That's a lot. I just planted one last week, and I don't think the cage <laughs> I put it I put around it is 18 feet. <laughs> you, now you can <laughs> you can tip them, uh, cut the top off, and then the lateral growth will will produce, but not quite as lo as good as if you let if you have a way to, on a fence line or something like that. Oh shucks! I could well maybe I can transplant it to my fence area. Mm -hmm that would just be on the other side of the bed. Well, I've learned something here today because I like the idea of this, the sweetness in mm -hmm. that. It's yellow, right? Yes. The little yellow tomato. Okay, John, thank you very much. And now let's go to Dr. Phil Nixon. I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois, which means I do bugs. Yay. And one thing that we see in a, uh, in a situation at this particular time is, uh, is that we end up with uh, holes sometimes in, in roses and uh, type of damage that uh, is showing up on the screen now uh, is uh, that damage caused by uh, pear slugs or rose slugs more specifically. Pear slugs will get on roses as well. But there's also rose slugs and there's two type of rose slugs. One is the rose slug and the other one's called the bristly rose slug and they will feed on the underside of the leaves. And so when you see that type of damage, you need to look on the underside to look for them. Um, they're kind of small right now. And in fact, it took me a while this afternoon to find one, but I finally did locate one. And it is at the end of the pen point. It is only about a, a little over an eighth of an inch long. And so it's only been out for a very short time. And, uh, and it will feed, feed on the, uh, on the uh, uh, the leaves in that way, the bigger holes that are in the, in the leaves could have been from some other caterpillar that showed up. But this is a very young rose slug. Uh, the true rose slug will look like a slug. It'll be it'll be blackish and and slimy, whereas a bristly rose slug starts out green. Both of them end up green by the time they're about a full grown and about a half an inch long. Uh, we control these with. Uh, in insecticidal soap will work well, but you've got to make sure you hit the bug with it. If you don't hit it, you don't kill it. Uh, something that will give you a little bit longer control is going to be Spinosad, and that's most available uh, to homeowners as a bonide product called a really colorful name, Dug Bug Brew. Dead Bug Brew. Dead Bug Brew. Mm. Dead Bug Brew and it will work, it's Captain Jack's dead bug brew or something of that nature. <laughs> uh, so it's really, really kind of got a, got a colorful name, but it's, but it's very effective. You can also use carbaryl, which is sold as seven, uh, permethrin, which is gonna be sold as eight insect spray. But if you're gonna use the spinosad, the, uh, the carbaryl known as seven, or the, or the pyrethroid sprays, the eight insect spray, you need to make sure that, you have, that you're not spraying the rose blossoms to avoid damage to bees and other pollinators. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a have a compound leaf, a compound rose, that is one that has more than one roll of petals, chances are good it's going to be a zero to pollinators anyway, as they bred these roses to make them really look nice and 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 uh, showy. They bred out the nectar and the pollen to where they're essentially useless in a garden as far as pollinators go. And so, if you don't see bees visiting your your roses they probably don't. Uh, single flowered ones will, and those are gonna have just one row of, of petals. Uh, they are normally gonna be pollinated and some of the others will be, some of them won't, most of them will not. So kind of watch for that. It gives you a clue as to what you can use on your roses and to avoid problem to pollinators. Pollinators aren't coming there, even though you put on something that may harm the pollinators, they're not gonna find it, not gonna be that bothered by it. What good information. Hey, Not that I'm surprised. I am just amazed how much there is to know. So, and those were little tiny. Oh, yeah. Makes me want to smash. I mean, um, uh, do away with them. I was holding myself back. That's cause, sacred life. Because there's a seen. bug guy here. Yes. So, well, thank you, Phil, for Bugs that. Bugs are neat. Bugs are buggy. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to give a little announcement. <clears throat> the show Mid American Gardener and Illinois Gardener put together are 24 years old. The show has been on 24 years. Applause from the camera folks. Yeah, applause from the set. Uh, so we are looking, we're starting our 25th year. Isn't that exciting for local programming? You were only okay. five years old at first I, Oh, Phil, thank you. <laughs> I would like to give you one of the apples on the set if you but would like that. Hurt my teeth. Okay, <laughs> well, let's go now to our special Did You Know video.
90% of insects can only eat plants native to their region. Even in places like parks, trees and flowers can originate from Africa or Australia. All right, let's go to the phone lines and we're gonna start first with Bob's question about ash trees and it's on line two. Hi, Bob. Thank you very much for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, I know I've got this ash borer and a couple of ash trees and I've cut some dead branches out of it. And now I've got all kinds of new growth. Uh, it's like a new tree is spawning. Is, is that normal or? Uh, uh, it, de it depends where the new growth is. A typical reaction that the ash tree has in relationship to emerald ash borer attack, because the borer starts at the top of the tree, it will girdle those branches higher up and the tree will put on new growth called uh, I call them water sprouts. Mm -hmm. uh, they're called epicormic branches uh, that, will, that will sprout out on the trunk and at the base of the major branches because that's really the only place where the tree can get, uh, can get nutrients and water to it. And so it's going to put on foliage where it can get, where it can get to them. Uh, eventually the borer will take down and take those out too, probably in the next year or maybe two. And once it gets through that, then you've got a dead tree. So uh, it is the right time to treat. We look at look at treating throughout most of the most of the Midwest uh, in the in the month of May, primarily. Uh, we're towards the towards the latter part of May, and I actually had a person bring in two live emerald ash borer adults from his home near 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 in central Illinois just this morning. So they are out. They need to be treated this time because the best way they control them with the systemic insecticides is they kill the adult beetles feeding on the leaves before they lay their eggs in the tree. Okay, well thank you, Bob, for that question. Let's go to Logan's question about pruning. Let's go to line three and Logan. Hi there. Hi, I have a, uh, I think it's called a chemist cypress. It's a false cypress. Oh yes, uh-huh. Uh, called bop and it's really gotten rank and out of uh, control, and I was just wondering, is now a good time to prune it? And if so, how much can I prune it back? I'd like to cut it down by, or cut it back by a good half, if I could. Okay, so Camisiparis, yeah. false cypress. Is, 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 uh, is the tree robust, or the, it's, it's doing well? Oh yeah, it's, yeah. it's a small shrub. Okay. It's probably four feet high, four feet across, and it's growing beautifully. You could probably get by with, with you know, you, you might want to go a little more gradual on it and reduce it little by little, but you could probably get by with that. I don't know. What do you, anybody else think? Uh, yeah. Generally, it's important to realize that uh, needled evergreens, such as the chemocypress and others, uh, are not going to grow back from the tips like uh, other plants do, so you go you would prune down to a to a juncture, a node, a branching, as you would with any plant. But many times with, with a needled evergreen, uh, to reduce the size of a plant, you're probably better off going all the way down to the trunk and cutting off an entire branch or a major part of a branch. And the way to tell whether you need that branch or not is, uh, is maybe have somebody else with you that kind of covers up that branch and you stand back and look at the plant to see if it's better with yeah. it or without it because <clears throat> uh, once you cut it off, of course, it's kind of hard to put it back. Uh, but, uh, but generally, your, your best way to prune is uh, definitely with that kind of tree. You would not do anything close to shearing. You would be pruning back entire branches or parts of branches to a, to a juncture with a, with a branch. I call it the buddy system in pruning because mm -hmm. yeah. you can't yeah. see it when you're right up no. to it, but you can look at it from a distance. Once it's cut off, it's, you can't glue it back right. on. <laughs> yeah. In bonsai, we cover up that branch of your hand mm. and then look at it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you can't do that with a four foot tall tree. So try that out, but that was a good question and thank you. Let's go to a, a question about red twig dogwood and Margie has this on line four. Hi Margie. Hello, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Yesterday I noticed uh, what I researched online to be called spittlebug on my red twig dogwood. They suggested spraying it off with water, and today that seems to have worked. Mm -hmm. My actual question is about their, their other suggestion, the online suggestion, to trim it down to the ground at this time of year. Does that seem like a good idea, or? 
It's, it's not something you would do to control the insects. Right. You're yeah. correct that just washing them off will do the job. But the ones that, that attack red twig dogwood are primarily the metal spittle, metal spittle bug, and they're not likely to cause any serious injury. There are some that attack needle evergreens that can cause dieback. But washing them off with water is as good a way as any. But I'll let the horticultural people ask about pruning down to the ground. When you do trim red twig dogwood or yellow twig, it's usually in March. Yeah. And you can trim it all the way down. Yeah, they're, uh, don't they're trim resilient. It. They just, I mean. We use it a lot for decorative things. Mm -hmm. And people trim it in the winter. Yeah, you yeah. want to do it when they're dormant. Exactly. Yeah. Now would not be a good time to do that. No. But that's a good method for pruning red twig dogwood. And if you let it go too long, it will develop other issues. Uh -huh. I mean, it could develop scale and, and, and then other it, it problems. tends to do the witching broom, too. Mm -hmm. If you do yep. it too late, it's just. Right. So it's too late for this year. But yes, that is a very good viable option for pruning red or yellow twig dogwood. OK, thank you, Margie, for that. And let's go to Shirley's question about Lily of the Valley. And let's go to line five. Hi, Shirley. Oh, hi. Thanks for taking my call. You are welcome. I have uh, a problem getting Lilies of the Valley started <laughs> uh, two years in a row. And uh, they died. This year was the first year I finally got at least six little plants uh, about three inches high and they're six inches apart. Do I put more plants in between them to start more, or do I have to leave them six inches apart? We had some reaction on the set because often people have trouble the other way. Yeah, yeah. it's getting, once you have them, you can't get rid of them. So her answer to should she put more if they're six inches apart is? is no, because no. they're <laughs> gonna fill in before you can whistle Dixie, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, um, if, if, if you're, depending on how large of a patch you really want, if, if uh, you want to expand that, I would expand it out and, and like, like you did before, put them about six inches apart and it'll be no time at all that that area will fill in. And once you have them there, they will crowd everything else out. Nothing <laughs> else will, will be, everything else will be shaded out. I have a neighbor that has probably a, a 20 by 20 spot and there isn't a single weed anything else growing but Lily of the Valleys. And she started out with just a few too, so. So it's patience. Yes, once you, once you get them started, yes. you, you shouldn't have any problem. Okay, so there you have it. Surely you can relax on that. Let's go to a question about uh, <coughs> tomatoes and it's uh, from Mary on line six. Hi, Mary. Hi, got a question about our loved little friend, the tomato worm. Um, where exactly do they come from? Do they come on the plant? Do they come from the ground? Where exactly? And how is there anything you can do to prevent them? Uh, the tomato worms are actually the larval stage of a sphinx moth, mm -hmm. and they overwinter here. If you're working the ground in the spring, it's a fairly common thing to run across a, uh, the pupa of one of these things. They're going to be kind of reddish brown in color mm -hmm. and about two inches long. And it looks like it's got a soda straw, which is bent back around down to the, to the side of it. That's actually the proboscis of the moth that's going to come out. And uh, these moths will come out. They feed like hummingbirds mm -hmm. in the evening and at night. They hover in front of a plant. They are kind of called the jet planes of the insect world. <laughs> they fly fast enough to outmaneuver and outfly bats, which is saying something very wow. seriously. Uh, so, uh, so, so the, the adult is a moth that uh, has about a five to six, five inch wingspan, maybe six inches, and they will lay eggs on tomato plants. And for those wondering the other side of it, well, how do you get rid of those? The, the tomato hornworms have a tendency to be up on the top part of the plant in the early morning. And so a good way to do it is on your way to work, spend a two or three extra minutes kind of slowing down and adjusting by picking off tomato hornworms off your tomatoes and smashing them before you get in the car and go to work. Uh, there are sprays that will also work, Bt, K, the, the uh, Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki, the dipel or thuricide will also work well. But hand picking is as good as anything yeah. and realize that there tend to be at the top of the plants in the early morning, so that's a good time to go look for them. And you can look for the little doo-doo underneath, on the leaves underneath to kind of, because they hide underneath. They yeah. tend to be underneath, and so if you look at the branches and you see a lot of little black specks, look look just up up the plant, and you're probably going to find a 
Mm. I know some folks who are fishermen and they and fisher people, mm. and they actually seek those out actively as bait. So, oh, yeah. so there's lots of ways you can go with that. Boy, good questions. Well, we're going to take a moment and go back around to the panelists. And uh, Bill, let's go to you. Sure. I've got a question about a tulip poplar, and an individual had a 70-foot tulip tree uh, that uh, gave up the ghost. It died in 2014. And now uh, beneath the drip line, he has a, a, a new sprout coming up about four feet tall. The question is, should I leave it or attempt to transplant? Or is it a volunteer or uh, an upstart from the former root system? My guess is that it is coming from the uh, root system that is suckering from there. Uh, if you really want to know, I guess you can kind of gingerly uh, dig around it, maybe even take a leaf blower and blow some of the soil off. You can tell if it's, uh, you know, rooted individually or if attached to the old root system. I would not move it, especially if it is attached to the, if it is coming up from the root system, you really can't. It's, it's very difficult. But uh, that tree should really g grow at a robust clip now because it has uh, the strength of at least some of that root system is going to keep going for that tree. It's, it's not enough probably food to keep the root system going from a 70-foot tree, but you've got a lot of, uh, you know, a, a turbocharge for that tree, so I would just leave it. Okay. Uh, sounds like a, a sprout or a volunteer from sounds the root like system. Sounds like a good deal if they liked the tulip poplar where it was. Sure. Here it is again. Okay, John, you're up. Okay, I, the second thing I brought today was some fennel. This is bronze fennel. And we're really concentrating on pollinator pockets. And I just wanted to make sure that people knew that you don't have to have flowers for a pollinator pocket. This is, looks like a seemingly, there's no, well, there's no flowers on this, but the caterpillars of some of the butterflies are going to love this. The swallowtails, they like this, dill, carrots, and that type of thing, which they, they'll take down and strip pretty much, but I mean, just plant an extra one or two, and, and um, I just thought people would like to know about, you don't have to always have just p flowers for pollinator pockets, and this, this is one of my favorites. And it is a beautiful plant. Yeah. And good seasoning, too. Yeah, oh yeah. All righty, thank you very much. And now, Phil. Tracy writes in and says, we dug up a new garden patch out of a sod in our yard a couple of weeks ago, went out to plant it, and tiny biting or stinging ants Swore my arms and legs when I dug into the soil. I'd like to know what type they are and if there's a way to get rid of them without harming the beneficials. By the way, last year they swarmed the sidewalk too and unfortunately ran up my legs and likewise bit <laughs> and stung. One of the basic problems is a lack of understanding that ants are beneficials. Uh, they are quite aggressive in, in killing off uh, pests of, of, of the plants that you've got. They're also good scavengers for, for dead bodies laying around, primarily of insects. And so, so ants are beneficial, uh, so they would be something that you wouldn't mind having, ideally. Uh, generally, if you have ants, they're going to, going to kind of disappear uh, through your tillage efforts and in, in a lawn mowing uh, in, a, in a consistent basis, most of those are going to kind of, kind of disappear. Trying to get rid of ants is about like trying to run through a brick wall. All that happens is, is your head gets bloody and the ants do fine. Uh, ants are so ubiquitous that anything you do to control an individual anthill will soon be replaced by another anthill. You just kind of hope maybe it's not the same kind. You can, uh, you, you can treat individual anthills uh, with permethrin, which is sold as eight insect spray. We really don't recommend it. These are beneficial insects. And why do they bite and sting? Well, they're very closely related to wasps. So they're kind of like an underground living wasp to a great extent. I know uh, I garden with long sleeves and gloves, and I always look at my wrists if I get into them. If you can just get them off right away, mm -hmm. they'll go about their business. Yeah. You're messing with their turf. That's right, so literally. You really are. <laughs> I know, I wasn't trying to make a pun there. You really are messing with them. So if you can just get away from it. Okay, well, let's go to our mag quiz next. Which of these do not grow on trees? A, persimmons, B, avocados, C, parsley, D, apples. 
sea parsley. Parsley could be a good uh, thing for. Yeah, that's another. Uh, because I know I've yeah. had parsley in uh, containers and had larvae mm -hmm. just eat it down to nothing. Mm -hmm. So when I plant parsley, don't just plant one. Yeah, no, plant an extra for that pollinator pocket. In fact, I started them from seed this year, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna. Or do like us, we only planted parsley, chives, and dill for caterpillars not to eat. You don't plan to have any others. Okay, well, it's hard with ch uh, chives to only have one. Well, I'll tell you, it's been a lovely show and great questions. We learned so much. I want to thank each of you for watching and you three for being here. We'll see you next time. Have a great week gardening. Bye-bye.